by the University of Otago's Department of Politics. My name is Peter Grace and we're here at the media production studios of the university. I'd like to welcome our live audience and I'd like to welcome those of you who joined us online. Uh, we're, as always, we're being uh, covered on Twitter today and uh, here's Nicole to tell you a little bit about that. Thank you, Peter. So this is the interactive part of Vote Chat 2014. We've dedicated part of the show to our social media audience. Using Twitter, you can follow all the live action from the studio as we will be tweeting. Also, we have a collection of Twitter questions that we've got from our followers over the past week. I'll be putting these to Julianne later in the show. For our live audience, it's not too late for you to get involved. You can simply log into Twitter, form your question and direct it to our Twitter handle, at OUVoteChat, or alternatively, use the hashtag VoteChat14. We'll be covering transport, carbon tax policy and the direction of the Green Party today, so we welcome questions along these issues. I'll now pass you back to Peter, who will check in with us later when we have some more Twitter questions. Thanks, Nicole. We're joined today by the Green Party's List uh, MP, Julianne Genta. Uh, thank you, Julie, for joining us. Julianne. Thanks for inviting um, me. Really interested, it's not very often that we get to talk to an American-born MP. <laughs> uh, you were brought up in, in Rochester in Minnesota, and then you moved as a young child to uh, LA, I believe. Yeah, I mostly grew up in Los Angeles County. Right. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about growing up in L.A. and perhaps even sort of your early political influences? Yeah, sure. So uh, growing up in L.A. is probably quite boring, incredibly boring, actually, especially where my parents lived. Um, we, lived at, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, so I never really lived in one house more than three and a half years. Um, what were and, your parents doing in L.A.? Uh, my dad was a cardiologist and my mom a dietitian. And, uh, well, we moved for a variety of reasons, but um, they met in Minnesota. And my dad's from Illinois, my mom's from Southern California. So we lived in all three of those places. But uh, Los Angeles is really, really car dependent. And so as a young person, it's impossible to be independent. And to get out, you, you need to be dropped off by car to get anywhere. So you're really reliant on your parents. If your parents work full time, as my parents did, it means it's, you're basically kind of stuck at home. And uh, at a young age, I sort of worked out when I was about 13 or 14, um, how to use the bus to get to the shopping mall. And that was a really exciting discovery for me because uh, suddenly I, I found there was a bus. This was before there was lots of information on the internet. So um, it, was pretty, it was pretty esoteric uh, trying to figure out exactly how the bus schedules ran. But I worked out that I could jump on a bus for, I don't know, 50 cents or something like that and make it to Delamo Mall where there were actually people. And that's, I think, one of the reasons probably that I'm quite interested in urban planning and transport planning is because of growing up in a place where it was so impossible to get around without a car. I'm always interested in that the path that people take. Uh, you know, you've you've you know, already said that, uh, that the LA's transport problems were something that, that were top of mind perhaps as growing up. But uh, you, uh, I believe, got a philosophy degree in the States and then went on and did an international relations degree in Paris and then a public planning degree in Auckland. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so was that something that you actually, a path that you took or was this sort of a little bit finding your own way? Uh, well, I suppose that when I was 18 or 19, I was um, interested, I, I was a choice between two paths, right? I considered civil engineering because I wanted to do something constructive to you know, help deal with our environmental problems and I thought maybe engineering was the way to go. Um, but I ended up studying philosophy because it was more challenging. And I think my interest in philosophy started with uh, arguments and debates that I would have with people because I had really strong convictions uh, about protecting the environment, about having a fair society uh, from a very young age. And I don't know where they came from, potentially um, science fiction, you know, you're able to imagine the world being different than it is now. Um, and so I, I was interested to find out what the basis was for those beliefs, because when I was in an argument with someone, I often would come down to values and it was just, it was impossible to persuade them if they didn't already think that it was important to look after the environment. I didn't really know how to convince them. And so that probably led me to philosophy a little bit, to, to examine the underpinnings of my own values and build up a rational philosophical basis for them. Um, of course, when you study philosophy, you kind of figure out that um, 
rational argument isn't the best way of persuading people of things. <laughs> Um, but I, I think it was really useful. And I, I ended up moving to France uh, for a couple of reasons. One was um, I had been reading Voltaire and Proust and a lot of other great stuff that had been translated from French. Um, and even uh, Engels had written, Frederick Engels had written in French. So when I was looking for a language to study, I picked French just because um, everything I've been reading that semester had been translated from French. And as I, I really wanted to learn another language. And you know, Americans, maybe a little bit like New Zealanders, um, don't speak any other languages typically, like, uh, unless they've come from another country, which a lot of people in America have. But um, I, at Berkeley, I met so many people who were students um, with me who were like trilingual because they'd been born in another country, immigrated to the US, learned English, and then learned another language as well. And I felt really pathetic. So um, I started learning French my last year. And I realized I had to move there to really be bilingual. Did you bilingual. pick it up quite quickly? It takes longer than you'd think. I mean, I started studying when I was 21, and I did uh, the equivalent of a full year worth of French. Uh, well, actually, it was two years of university French in one year. And then I moved to France. And I'd say it took me about a year to be really uh, even anywhere near fluent. And uh, after, after about three or four years, then, yeah, it's definitely settled in. And I don't think I'll ever lose it. But um, the other reason I left the United States was George W. Bush. Um, I always really disagreed with um, US foreign policy. And I, I never really saw myself represented by either the political parties that are um, typically the choices in the United States, which is Democrats or Republicans. Um, and, but it was really bad when George W. Bush was elected. And then, of course, after 9-11, the kind of outpouring of crazy nationalism uh, around the country was really terrifying. And I just thought, you know what, I don't want any part of this. I, I don't believe I can change it, so I'm just going to leave. So, so I went to France. And so you would have walked in straight into the backlash of, of George W. Bush's uh, American fries comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how did the French take, take that? Yeah, so it's interesting um, because I guess what I figured out living in France was that um, I'm a certain uh, subculture of American that's quite critical of America, and uh, that's actually very a very American thing. And the people in in France who are really critical of the United States, they aren't necessarily critical for the right reasons. Like if they've been born in the U.S., they might be just as nationalist as um, sort of the worst um, sure. Americans. Um, so yeah, so that was an interesting discovery. Um, and I did think that people were occasionally quite rude. You know, I, I couldn't imagine if I met someone from another country, um, immediately the first thing I would say to them is, oh, we didn't invite your horrible, you know, ruler, whoever they are, to the tables. Because I did have, um, um, my boyfriend at the time, his mother's cousin said that to me once. He was like, he was trying to guess where I was from, trying to guess my accent. And I was quite flattered because he thought I was a native French speaker. He thought I was Swiss or, or Belgian or something, or ca uh, maybe Canadian, French Definitely Canadian. Definitely not from around these parts. But it, he, I, I was really flattered because I thought, oh, my French must be pretty good. He, he doesn't realize I'm a native English speaker. And so when I said American, he just was, oh. we didn't invite George W. Bush to the table. And to me, that was quite offensive because I mean, I, I had to leave the country that I grew up in because I disagreed with it. And I thought it was horrible to just be, it, for it to be assumed that I supported what was going on. Because mo I feel quite a huge number of Americans didn't support it. Yep. Um, we, we do want to ask you some more yeah. questions about that uh, a little later on. But uh, in the meantime, one of the things I'm interested in is um, uh, this uh, a uh, question about um, philosophy and the communication of philosophy. Um, you know, you, 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 it's very, it would be fair to say you're, with three degrees you're, you're an intellectual. Uh, you walk into a parliament here in New Zealand which is not intellectual. Um, and, uh, and I wonder how uh, often you perhaps struggle to, you know, with the philosophy angle of perhaps over intellectualising something that. Um, oh, well, I think that. You know, since I've uh, started working in politics, um, which I, I technically went from being a consultant to advising the Green Party for about a year and a half before I stood, before I was elected to parliament, um, there certainly was an important exercise in understanding how to simplify language and not write things like you're writing for an academic paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely an important learning is that um, 
when I was a consultant, we would write reports, really long reports, and I'd want them to be really well researched, and I'd really agonize over the wording and trying to make it as precise and clear as possible. And what I discovered when I got into politics is no one has time to read anything. <laughs> so there's really no point in writing a report. Um, the best way to communicate and persuade people is probably through infographics, and you should be focusing on like graphic design to communicate with people quickly. Um, yeah, so that. Well, I, was, I was thinking also about uh, the act leader, Jamie Lee White's um, comments about incest, which would have been appropriate perhaps in a lecture room <laughs> about f where philosophy. Well, they, no, well, no, well, you I know what I mean. I understand. Where it was an intellectual argument I rather where than a Jamie's moral argument. Coming from. Uh, but, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't find it that difficult. Uh, t I think there's there's all types of people represented in Parliament. Um, in my own caucus, there are two people who have doctorate degrees, so um, I feel pretty comfortable, um, you know. And I think that people appreciate it when you can make an argument for a policy and back it up with reasons and evidence. I, I, what I've gotten from people is that they really are glad to have someone making well thought out arguments okay. that are supported by evidence. Okay. You're, you're also an expert in, in the transportation field. Uh, and before you became an MP, I understand you were a consultant yep. to many councils and, and cities, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. In so, Auckland, um, I was a consultant. I beg your pardon. Uh, I was going to ask, um, do you feel that um, this is an unusual place to come from, being an expert in your portfolio before you get there? Because we, we think of ministers as being people who sort of appear through ideological reasons mm. or because of seniority in a party and then get there and find out about their portfolio when it's sort of handed to them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, is this, is this a, a, a point of difference, do you think? Well, I think that in some areas it would be very advantageous to have some specialist knowledge, and transport's probably one of them, uh, because um, there's, it helps to have some understanding of why things are the way they are, and if you want them to be different, it, it's helpful to understand what needs to change. And in the case of transport, it turns out it's not really people in New Zealand who've chosen the transport environment that we have. It's technocrats. Um, it's been bureaucrats um, at the NZTA or before that, Transit New Zealand and LTNZ, and uh, people in city councils. And um, what I've realized when I was advising councils and NZTA on changes to policy was that um, it was politicians who were driving the, the policy. And I guess that's what motivated me to consider standing for parliament and to be a politician is because I felt like it would be really useful if there was someone who, who understood transport um, you know, to actually be having some input into the high level policy because otherwise we're never gonna get a different outcome. Okay. Uh, and there's a difference between policy making and, and, and participative democracy. Uh, and it was interesting, we had uh, on Vote Chat recently had Colin Craig from the Conservative Party saying that they were going to move towards a more sort of referendum based policy making mm. where people would be asked on every question uh, what they thought of it before perhaps uh, the policy makers got involved. Um, very interested in you know, your use of Twitter uh, in terms of um, asking questions of, of um, your electorate and, and supporters. And I understand that uh, you um, uh, recently um, got ticked off, uh, if I've got that right, for um, tweeting in the middle of a... Um, a, a select committee. Select panel. Um, well, so what's your feeling about that? How did you... Well, the only person who criticised me was Cameron Slater. And I think, you know, he's got some other motivations for criticising anything the Green Party does. I mean, I, I haven't seen him ever really be very supportive of anything we've done. Um, and I've tried to engage with him on other issues where I thought we could have some common ground and he's basically ignored me. Like he invited me to write a, a guest post and I did and then he never put it up. So um, I, I don't think that his criticism is really based on any legitimate problem with what I was doing. He's just looking for ways to say, oh, look at this person, she's wasting your tax dollars. Um, she hasn't done her homework before going to select committee. Now, it's funny because I, I hadn't planned to live tweet select committee. Um, I went into select committee, we were interviewing, twice a year we get the opportunity to interview ministers or ask them questions. 
and uh, I noticed that there weren't many journalists in the room. It was an early, early meeting, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to tweet this because a lot of my followers on Twitter are really interested in transport, um, and a lot of them actually have a lot of specialist knowledge, um, as much as I do, or they're, they're, they have more knowledge on the ground. And so it occurred to me while I was tweeting that even though I had my own questions, I could ask them if they had any questions, and maybe I'd get a good one. And uh, I, so I did something similar when I went into Commerce Committee um, for the vote communications interview with Minister Amy Adams. Yep. And I think that people on Twitter really appreciated it. I think they found it really interesting. So and I got some, some good questions. You got some good questions. Yeah, well, particularly uh, for Amy Adams, because I don't, I'm not the ICT portfolio holder. I was covering it for Gareth Hughes. Yes. And um, so although I had some questions, I thought, actually, there's a lot of people on Twitter who have a lot of knowledge in ICT. So I might as well put it out to them and see if they have any good ideas. And I thought that was a great way to make select committee more interesting and accessible for people. And I thought, hey, I'm here. I'm a representative. I might as well ask questions on behalf of and give information back to people on Twitter because, yeah, I ju it just seemed like a good idea at the time. And I think it was a good idea. Okay. Well, Nicole's got a Twitter question from uh, one of our audience. Yeah, absolutely. One of our Twitter followers, Matthew Beveridge, yesterday asked a question surrounding freedom of speech on the internet. And he would like to know, Julianne, how many people have you blocked on Twitter? Do you know, I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't know how to find it out. When I started using Twitter, I, I made it a, sort of a policy not to block anyone. But um, more recently, in the past few months, I've had um, some people who are cl very clearly trolls. They don't have many followers. You know, let's say they have 12 or, th or 15 or 30 followers, and they just kind of tweet me with really negative, um, almost abusive uh, tweets. And so. I've started blocking some of those people just because it kind of made, I mean, I'm, a, I'm kind of a sensitive person. I know you're not meant to be if you're a politician, but, um, you know, if sometimes when you, when you look on Twitter and you see someone just with just outright negative, abusive attack on you, um, and it, it just, it can make you feel bad. So just for my own mental health, I started blocking some of those people if they were being abusive. But I, there's many people who don't um, necessarily side with the Greens politically, um, who I would never block. We have interesting engagement, interesting debate on Twitter, and I'm quite happy to have uh, a calm, rational debate with someone who has a different point of view. I just don't want to get abuse from people who are, I'm clearly never going to be able to persuade. Okay. Um, let's move on to um, some questions about the direction that the Green Party is heading in. Um, on uh, Tuesday, the NBR uh, came out and said um, that your new carbon tax proposal uh, was badly received by farmers and businessmen. And, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting uh, comment to make in the light of the fact that uh, the MANA party and the Internet party are sort of uh, making the headlines at the moment, um, that, um, that Labor uh, is also... Um, perhaps positioning itself uh, more left uh, than it has been previously. And uh, so I'm interested in the, this question of uh, whether you were actually strategically targeting the farmers and the businessmen in a way to uh, paint yourself as being slightly more left uh -huh. and occupy that space? No, I don't think we were targeting anyone. I mean, what we're targeting is greenhouse gas emissions. And we want a policy that's going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there are some businesses and, and some farms uh, at the moment result in too many greenhouse gas emissions. And so necessarily, if we're going to transition to a low carbon economy, which we have to do eventually, right. uh, then they're going to have to change how they're doing things a little bit. And, um, but this is a stumbling block, isn't it? Because well, I don't think so. Because farmers and businessmen Because um, I think that that NBR article is wrong. I think we had quite a lot of broad-based support for our policy. I mean, we had David Fair from Kiwi Blog, and we had the Taxpayers Union, uh, not exactly lefty or grainies, saying that it was actually a really smart policy, and they agreed with it. So the only people who were speaking out against it were federated farmers who apparently don't have a coherent uh, policy or um, understanding of climate change. Change. I mean, they were unable to state what exactly their position was on climate change and whether or not they should have to reduce their emissions. And um, Business New Zealand, who, uh, as I mean, I think maybe I should, maybe this is too much. I think they're being a little. It's a little bit politically motivated because the only real people who seem to be attacking it were like the National Party. Um, and I think it's just because we're their political enemies. And instead of engaging in a debate about why this might not be the best policy, they just say, oh. 
it's crazy. You're off right. the planet. Well, it's what the Secretary General of the OECD gave a speech on, you know, a couple of days ago. It's what Obama uh, announced this week that they're going to be taking action, not with a carbon tax per se, but with regulation, not with cap and trade. China's going to be moving on it. Like the whole world knows that we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that means not continuing with the status quo. And I'd say that the NBR, um, Business New Zealand, Federated Farmers, and the National Party are all protecting the status quo. Yes, but, but I mean, uh, I think a fair question is whether the carbon taxes are going to be enough. Uh, you know, well, the carbon tax wasn't our entire policy. Um, if you read our policy paper, we had a number of initiatives where we uh, announced areas where we would be shifting crown funding uh, in infrastructure, in energy, and in other areas in order to help reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, as well as putting a price on carbon and recycling the money to households and business in the way of a climate tax cut. So the price on carbon is only one part of it. Um, we actually have a very comprehensive uh, climate protection plan that was also part of it. But we, were, we focused on the, the, the climate tax cut side, and of course the media focused on the tax part of it. Um, but really households and business are going to be better off mostly uh, once we implement our climate tax cut. And on top of it, we would shift government investment so that it would be easier for households and business to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So it just sets us on a path for um, a prosperous economy where we don't rely on ever increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Do you think that, um, that the climate change thing is getting more advanced and more of a problem and we're heading towards a crisis? and that uh, we're going to have to be more draconian in the way that we deal with some of these problems than just this sort of uh, giving and taking um, way we're doing with at the moment. Well, certainly uh, the sooner we act, the more affordable it's, it's going to be to change, um, the, more, the longer transition we can have, and uh, the sooner we're going to benefit. Um, you know, and Sir Lord Stone, from the UK um, economist identified that countries that are the first to take advantage of shifting to a low carbon economy are going to benefit the most from it. So there's no real advantage in delaying as far as I can see. And certainly the science is getting clearer and clearer. There's a very strong scientific consensus that we, we, we do have to take action. We are on a path to disaster if we don't change the status quo. But the great thing is that there's such a positive opportunity in this. I mean, there's a lot of things we're doing that not only um, increase greenhouse gas emissions, they cost us more money. Um, they result in air and water pollution. Uh, they result in worse health outcomes. So if there's smart things we can do that are going to get benefits um, in a range of areas, why not do them? Well, let's uh, move to your um, topic of specialty, which is transport. Uh, if you were the Minister of Transport, would your core focus be on Auckland? I mean, Auckland is the, probably the major polluter in terms of transport. Uh well, actually, there's opportunities to improve the transport system all around New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I talk about Auckland a lot because I'm an Auckland-based MP and um, a third or more of the country lives there and it's growing very quickly. Um, so there is an urgent need to invest in rail in Auckland. If we don't get the city rail link, um, we're basically at capacity on our rail network. And so we've invested in electric trains. Um, we've got electrification being rolled out at the moment, and that's in a large part thanks to the Green Party, who were campaigning on, it on to, in 2007. But we've got this bottleneck at Britomart, and that means we can't run trains at greater frequencies. So we're stuck with trains every 15 minutes rather than trains every five minutes. And obviously, it's going to be very difficult to make rail attractive to people to get around the city if um, you don't make it more frequent. I mean, people, everybody knows that. If it's more frequent, it's more convenient, people are more likely to use it. That gets cars off the roads. That's better for freight and the people who need to use the roads. So it's a win-win. I think there's a lot of Aucklanders that just don't even think about rail that get in their cars because it's an automatic thing uh, and drive and then have that horrible frustration of having to try to get around walking. Yeah, yeah, it's very frustrating. So all around New Zealand, uh, most people have to use a car to get most places and that's not because they're bad people, it's because they have no choice because we haven't invested in the alternatives. And that is a direct result of choices made by local government and especially central government. And so if central government has a different policy, it makes it easier and safer for kids to walk and cycle to school, for people to cycle to work, for people to take public transport, then a certain percentage of people will do that. There's, you know, it's not going to be 100%, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, right now it's more than 8 out of 10 people using a car to get to, get to work. 
in cities with balanced transport systems, it's more like one out of three or one out of four people who use a car to get to work. So there'll still be people using cars, but if we invest in the alternatives, we also free up the roads for the people who need to drive. So there's, it just makes sense to do that. And I don't understand why it's a political issue in New Zealand, because in other countries, it's not a right or left issue. It's just, it's like, it's not about values. It's geometry, guys. Um, moving a bunch of people around in cars is not a good way to move a large number of people in, a, in, a, in an urban area. So it's really just down to government policy. If they prioritize different projects, everyone's going to be better off. Um, some people are going to be able to use the train, and a lot of people will get huge benefits from that, because having to drive everywhere is a total pain. It costs us a lot of money. Like, households and businesses are having to spend more than three times more than government just to use the infrastructure that government's building. So, you know, government's spending four billion of our tax dollars every year on roads, mainly, and households are spending over $12 billion a year on vehicles and fuel to run them. And all of that's imported. So if we can make it easier for some people to take the bus, take the train, walk or cycle, they save money because they don't have to spend as much on cars and fuel. Government saves money because they don't have to spend as much money on um, the roads. Um, and the people who aren't driving save time. Because you know you can't read or relax or make a phone call or be on the internet when you're driving, you know. And so th there's this, there's all these benefits. It just makes great sense. Uh, I believe Nicole's got a uh, Twitter question for us. Yeah. So this has sparked interest in Steve Wright, one of our Twitter followers. He's concerned that trains aren't cheap either. He'd like to know what proportion of the Auckland Central Rail Loop the Greens would be uh, willing to fund. So. Um, I wish I could show you a graph right now of what the transport spend is, because trains are actually a lot cheaper than a new, a new highway once you take into account the fact that the people driving on the highway um, are going to have to get off the highway and they're going to congest the local roads and then they're going to have to find a place to ca park their cars. So the city rail link um, is somewhere around $2 billion, right? Um, at the moment, uh, the government's funding more than $2 billion on the Waterview Connection. The Waterview Connection is about eight lanes of motorway, uh, only a couple of kilometers long. Doesn't get anyone from their house to work. It's just one section of road. Um, what the city rail link will do is double the capacity of the entire rail network and take cars off the road. So it makes our existing roads work better and, it makes, um, and it's great for the people who are able to take the train. So just to, to put that in comparison, the, the relative benefits of the investment in rail are enormous compared to the benefits of a couple of extra kilometers on the state highway network. Um, and we would fund 60% of the city rail link and make it a number one priority. And we would enable Auckland Council to use means other than rates to raise revenue to pay for their share as well. Because there's lots of ways that you could um, raise revenue in a more intelligent way that would also get better outcomes for the transport network. Thanks, thanks, Nicole. Um, Auckland's problems transport-wise are very different from the rest of the countries in many ways. Uh, what other regions do you think have transport issues that need to be addressed? Well, everywhere in the country, um, kids are getting dropped off at school by car. And that's because we've created a road environment where it's incredibly dangerous for kids to walk and cycle. And so I think that all across New Zealand, in towns and cities, where people live within a few kilometers of schools, uh, the road environment should be designed with kids' safety in mind first. That should be the priority. Um, because it's better for their health, it's better for their ability to learn, it saves parents time and energy and money, um, it reduces pollution. I mean, there's, it just makes sense, and it's not that expensive. I mean, at the moment, we spend less than 1% of the transport budget on walking and cycling. Um, you could you know, increase that tenfold, and you wouldn't even make a dent in your new state highways budget. You, know? you wouldn't even notice. And yet, that would have a massive impact in terms of reducing congestion in areas where there is congestion, but also just, um, it's like kids' birthright to be able to walk and cycle to school. Yeah, I think you're right to be highlighting this thing about road safety because uh, we're seeing more and more um, people being knocked off bikes, particularly around Auckland. Uh, we're seeing kids being killed in driveways. You know, I mean, uh, do you think that the government's doing the right things in terms of road, road safety, or are there things that they should be addressing? Well, the number one thing to do is to reduce vehicle dependence. I mean, in countries that have high levels of car use, you have more per capita accidents or crashes that result in injuries and fatalities, not to mention the fact that there's all sorts of health impacts from inactivity. 
um, you know, people who take public transport or walk or cycle get more activity in their day-to-day -day lives than people who drive everywhere. And so by um, spending money on the alternatives so that you give people more choices, um, then you reduce your crash rate and you have a healthier population. And that's really clear. It's really clear all across the world that that's, that's the pattern. Um, yes, we, and also, you can put money into targeted safety improvements on our existing roads and maintenance um, if you aren't spending all the money on just a few new state highways, which the government is doing. Right. Now, um, uh, just as an example, the Prime Minister John Key um, got something very wrong on the radio a while back. Um, he was talking about the road north of Wellington, where we're going to be spending an un I mean, insane amount of money um, upgrading a highway where there hasn't been increasing traffic volumes for a decade. So there's no, no increase in car trips on the highway north of Wellington. Uh, there's a rail line that it's directly competing with the, with the highway. Um, and the government's going to spend billions and billions of dollars on uh, the highway. And they're saying it's really important because of safety. And the prime minister said something like 140 people die every year on the road north of Wellington. That's not true. Unfortunately, one or two people die every year on that road one or two, but because we're spending such a huge percentage of the money on just a few state highways, we're actually going to miss out where most of the accidents happen. And um, so, yeah, having a more balanced transport spend, I think, is the best. You've got to have a more ambitious target. You know, in Sweden, they have Vision Zero. That's their road safety plan, Vision Zero. They haven't achieved it, but at least they're aiming for zero fatalities. Here, we're quite happy to have over 300 fatalities a year. That's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable. Or there's a focus only on holiday fatalities and, and not on any other type. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's a focus on, oh, somehow if we build a new road, that's going to make it safer. Well, in the vast majority of uh, road accidents, the, it's not the road that has anything to do with it. It's speed and attention, tiredness, alcohol. Those are the factors that cause accidents. They're human. And you know, if you reduce the need for humans to have to drive everywhere, you, <laughs> you're going to reduce the likelihood that they're going to be tired or drinking or distracted and have an accident. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the Green Party and uh, its attitudes towards regulation. I mean, you support regulatory measures such as uh, traffic light, uh, food labelling, uh, minimum pricing on alcohol, uh, plain packaging on cigarettes. How does that square with your uh, own philosophies about uh, uh, civil liberties? Well, some of that supposed regulation that you're talking about, like yeah. traffic light, food labeling, <coughs> or country of origin labeling, is actually not regulation for the point of telling people what to buy. It's regulating the producers and adver advertisers so that consumers have more information, so they can make a more informed choice. Mm -hmm. So that's not, we're not banning things. We're, we're saying people need to have better information so they can make better choices, which I think is directly in line with um, that sort of approach. And when it comes to a regulatory approach to things like tobacco or gambling, it's very, very clear that those are problems that are social and environmental problems. They're not, they're not a problem of individual willpower, you know. A lot of these things are, um, I, I, I can't think of another word to use other than addictive. I mean, it's clear that um, not all of us are perfectly rational actors. In fact, I'd say none of us are. Um, and um, it's, it's unfortunate that private industry is able to prey upon people's weaknesses in order to make a profit. And we actually want to protect people from people who are making a profit off of things that are actually quite bad, like death and destruction, like tobacco and gambling. I've been asked to go on to a question about Twitter. Uh, and um, there's, uh, your colleague uh, Jan Logie was recently in hot water for a tweet regarding Bill English and the budget. Uh, she's. Um, Come out regretting that comment, but um, how hard is it to, for the, uh, to adhere to this Green Party value of engaging without personal attacks in a political environment where the engagement is uh, often disrespectful? Um, I think we do all right. I mean, I think we do a pretty good job. Like in the House, um, we're never barracking or yelling at the others. Um, I don't find that difficult not to do um, most of the time. Um, it's, it was, I found it quite surprising when I went into Parliament um, just how unprofessional an environment it is. I mean, I've never experienced anything like it anywhere else. Um, whatever audience you speak to, it's very unlikely that someone's going to start heckling you. No one's heckling here. They wouldn't be heckling anywhere else except in Parliament. Um, but 
Uh, you know, I, I don't think I don't think it's that hard. Um, look, obviously, Jan Logie was you know it was a play on words, and you know it didn't it sort of fell flat, didn't work out too well. Was you know interpreted taken badly, and she's apologized for that. Um, but I don't think many of us are getting in trouble very often. I mean, you always have to be a little bit careful with Twitter, um, and I probably err on the side of caution. So I'll write tweets and sometimes not send them because I'm not sure if it's going to be interpreted okay. correctly. Okay, Nicole's got another Twitter question. Uh, yes, so this morning the Green Party issued a press release announcing that they wish to decriminalise abortion. We've had a tweet in from Stevie Jepson, and she'd like to know what are the implications of this and your thoughts? Well, I was quite surprised to find out, um, you know, mm. uh, that actually it was criminalised, that abortion is criminalised, and in order for a woman to have access, um, she's got to get two different specialists to agree that um, she's got major health problems that require it. Now, of course, 99%, I think, or more are actually approved, but there's this big rigmarole that people have to go through. And so the Green Party has had a policy uh, that's always been pro-choice, I think, and we've just had an update to our policy, which I think makes it clear that we'd want to move away from the stigma attached to and leave it up to what you know it's really up to the woman it's her body it's her choice we're going to let her decide and there's no reason for the state to be intervening and saying um you need to be proven to have mental health problems by two people in order to have access to to an abortion i, I just think it's like finally we're going to catch up with um you know modern countries which have been treating women with respect and giving them rights um, over their own body for many decades now Okay, thank you. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Ibsen's uh, current MP, John Banks, was uh, found guilty of filing a false donation return during his 2010 Auckland mayoralty bid. Uh, he's my local MP too. He's your local MP. I live in Epsom. And uh, so, obviously, we're really interested, not so much perhaps in, in uh, Mr Banks, but uh, in uh, what this does in terms of uh, the electorate and, uh, and the national majority. Well, it's not going to make a difference, obviously. John Key already knew this was a threat, and that's probably one of the biggest reasons they decided to call an early election and have the election in September as opposed to having it in November when you would expect it to be, um, is the fact that they were going to lose their numbers, or there was a good risk that they would. Of course, it's a little bit disturbing to see that they've somehow managed to defer the actual sentencing until after the House rises. Um, you know, uh, it's very cynical, I think. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably not right. Um, John Meggs probably should resign now that he's got this conviction. And um, I, the government clearly um, doesn't have that much legislation to get through. Um, there's going to be a lot of valedictories. We've only got a few sitting weeks left before the House rises. So um, I think National was prepared for this. They delayed the, court, the actual court case as long as they could. And, and now they're delaying the sentencing in order to maintain their numbers. It just demonstrates how narrow their majority is. I mean, there is a whole lot of controversial legislation that has been passed in the last term of parliament by one vote, 61-60. And I think um, yeah, it really shows that they've just got a very narrow majority. And what about this coattailing issue? Because obviously not only have we seen it with ACT and Epson, but we're also seeing the beginnings of that with the Internet Mana Party. What's your feeling about that? So the Green Party has always been very, very clear that um, we want to implement the recommendations of the Electoral Commission after New Zealanders overwhelmingly voted to support um, MMP and keep MMP uh, in 2011. Um, there was a review of MMP and the Electoral Commission uh, made some recommendations, um, one of which uh, was getting rid of the coattailing provision and dropping the threshold to 4%, as it is in most jurisdictions that have MMP, and, we ha and as was initially proposed in New Zealand, was to have the threshold at 4%. So if you can get more than 4% of the vote, you should get representation in Parliament. Um, if you have just won a seat, then you get that seat, but you shouldn't get the extra bit. And um, it's been gamed by National for a while now, um, and they've used it to stay in power and have this one, this one seat majority. And of course, they're trying to get extra. Like, I mean, the whole goal is for ACT to get more than 0.5% uh, of the vote or whatever it is they get, so they could actually get an extra MP. I'm not sure it's going to happen for them. Um, 
But now, of course, Mana, and the, I guess what I'd say is National had the opportunity to reform MMP and to listen to the Electoral Commission, to listen to the people of New Zealand, and they ignored it very cynically because they knew that it would jeopardize their ability to have coalition partners and to stay in power for a third term. And that's a very cynical reason, I think, to, to ignore um, what the public have said about MMP. And uh, now, people on the other side of the political spectrum, mana and internet, are trying to use the same game to try and beat national. Um, and uh, the Green Party doesn't support it, but look, it's what the rules are now. We're not doing it, but th those are what the rules are. And national had the opportunity to change them. We would like to change them if we get into power, is to, ch you know, to actually listen to what the Electoral Commission recommended. Well, the Internet Party, of course, is saying uh, that from their perspective, um, they're the new boys on the block. Uh, whether you agree with that or not, um, and that uh, MMP is sort of due for a revitalisation, that we've seen the same parties for a long time and the same, same people appearing regularly like Winston Peters and Peter Dunn and people. Uh, would you agree with that? Do you think that this, um, you know, the democracy here needs a, a re revitalisation? I think it would be great if uh, New Zealand, no, we haven't had MMP for that that long compared to other countries. Um, I think it would be great if there were more parties represented in Parliament. I think that um, that's one of the wonderful things about MMP is that you get more diverse representation and you don't just get uh, domination by a few big parties. And I think we're still in that transition from a FPP environment to an MMP environment. People don't totally get it yet, but we're starting to get there. Um, I think it's fantastic that the Green Party um, is able to be represented in Parliament here and is going from strength to strength. I mean, we're the third largest party, mo very, very stable compared to some of the other ones. But I, I, I think there's nothing, the best thing for democracy, I think, is to have a lot of voices heard and represented and at the table. The, um, the, the fact that there might be more parties under this new MMP um, means that the vote will be spread even more thinly. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I think the Roy Morgan poll came out saying that the Greens had dropped by 4.5 per cent down to 9 per cent. Uh, do you place much weight on, on polls? And, and where do you think, if that you are losing support, where is that support? I don't going think we're to? losing support. I mean, if you look at the polls since the last election, we're very consistently polling um, over what we got at the election last time. So we're polling between around 12 per cent. Um, nine is within the margin of error on the Roy Morgan polls. You know, it's within three. I think we're probably still somewhere around 11 or 12. And if you look at where we were um, three years ago, you know, at this time, a couple of months out from the last election, uh, if we had been polling 9%, it would have been good. Um, and yet we got 11% on the day. So I think there's a long way to go. I don't think we're losing support at all. Um, I think that. Both Labour and National are very broad churches, and I think that actually there's a lot of dis, dis, you know, different views within those big parties, and um, that's the opportunity, I think, provided by MMP, is to actually have, rather than a bunch of different views represented by one hierarchy that's making decisions, um, you, you can actually have uh, more specific representation of the different different views. And then if people are working together properly in an MMP environment, if you've got a multi-party coalition, you're actually going to have a more stable government that's making decisions in the interest of a broader um, a broader range of New Zealanders, which I think is going to be better lawmaking than at the moment uh, what we've seen with the last government, with National being in power with a one-seat majority, um, they were able to pass legislation that's actually very unpopular, like the asset sales legislation. And um, to, to me, that's, that's actually a less stable environment because you've got a small group of people able to make decisions that are unpopular with the majority. It's in effect, going back to first past the post, yeah. in a sense, isn't it? Uh, so finally, uh, there's been a lot of talk this year about housing affordability and about immigration and the economy. What do you see as being the key issues uh, for this election? Uh, I think that housing is going to be a big issue, and certainly in Auckland. And I have a lot of interest in this because typically the housing debate um, is quite ill-informed. Firstly, <laughs> I have to say this. You cannot consider housing affordability independent of transport affordability. So uh, land values are higher in the center of the city because there's a lot of access there. That's where people want to be. And it, we can't deal with our housing affordability problem simply by opening up green fields on the fringe of the city. Um, you're going to have cheaper houses, but you're going to have higher transport costs. So the impact on households can actually be much worse. And the impact on local government can be much worse because it's going to require a whole lot more infrastructure. 
Um, obviously, there's uh, the impact of speculators, and that's why the Green Party has consistently argued for a capital gains tax, um, excluding the family home, to which would make a difference in terms of uh, speculators. And I think it, it would definitely make it easier for first home buyers if, if we didn't have um, a certain generation of asset-rich people owning most of most of the houses and driving up driving up the prices. There's no relationship right now between rents and house prices in Auckland. I rent in Auckland. If we bought the apartment that I'm living in, our mortgage would be more than twice what our rent is. Absolutely. And to me, that makes it very clear that there's a bubble. The Green Party also, and I think this is really important because this is not anti-immigrant. I want to I, I want to make this point. Um, the Green Party has a policy of limiting the purchase of land um, to residents and citizens. And we've been told uh, some people on the right are calling that xenophobic. I don't think it's xenophobic at all. I think it makes sense. The reality is that foreign capital is driving up house prices in cities like Auckland and cities across the world. There's no question that foreign capital is coming in and driving up prices. And we have to be honest about that and we have to have information on it. The Reserve Bank and the government don't actually know what percentage of new home purchases are from overseas buyers who aren't planning to live here. Um, and I think we need to know that. The Green Party has a very tolerant policy, I think, towards immigrants, where it's like, if you want to come live here, we want to make it easy for you to apply for residency and to get citizenship. And then you can, you know, if you've got residency, you can buy land. But um, so there's nothing xenophobic about ad acknowledging the fact that foreign capital has an impact on housing affordability in New Zealand. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to wrap up now, but I uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. No problem. Uh, and thank you to our audience for, for being here. Um, that's all we've got time for. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, remember that you can uh, watch our previous vote chats on our YouTube channel, which uh, I have to read because I can't remember it, as OU Vote Chat. Uh, thanks again and uh, join you next time.